share the number four trend, the gig economy and contract work. Tina, do you freelance? <laughs> oh, too bad, I should have asked you for help with this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pundits have been lamenting for some time the demise of the traditional employment arrangement in the gig economy. I'd like to talk about <laughs> some of the facts and talk also as well about the implications for our science, for our practice, and for our professional rights as well. So what do we mean by gig work? Uh, many use the term to refer to anything that references a non-standard employment relationship, independent work. A most restrictive meaning is to think of online platform <coughs> workers. The most reasonable is uh, freelancing. Gig work represents a short-term relationship between a buyer and a seller. The worker has more, more or less chooses when and where they get to work. They have a high degree of autonomy, and payment in the end is by the task or deliverable, not by time. So the question is, how big is this? The challenge is that the range of estimates we have are very, very different. BLS estimates would suggest about 16 million workers. The Upwork estimate, that's from the survey, about 57 million. Differences in methods. Other approaches include following the money. JP Morgan Chase Institute data indicate that about 1.1% of account holders in a given month engage in some form of platform mediated work in either transport or other service areas. But the actual growth numbers are pretty modest. And the Upwork survey data actually showed a slight decline from 2017 to 2018, yet they, hi they highlight the 2014 to 2018 numbers. Some economists have actually walked back their numbers. So why do people freelance? Well, this isn't all bad. Flexibility is key, so is the autonomy. But for a great many, gig work is really about filling in the rough spots. For example, entry into the transportation sector tends to follow a decline in income. So people engage for multiple reasons, including the chance to use their skills. There's also evidence that some are attracted to the social connections that they can create through an expanded clientele, particularly for expert workers. This is more than Uber. The occupational list includes doctors, lawyers, accountants, psychologists, and more on that in a minute, as well as web designers, data scientists, and Python programmers. As psychologists, we should be naturally interested in understanding more about people who choose to do this kind of freelance work. There is some data. Coleman and L found that MTurk workers tend to be a little less extroverted, a little less agreeable uh, compared to student populations. In my own work, based on the interpersonal personality circumplex, I found that Turk Prime workers, which represent a broader constituents, tend to be pretty much equally distributed across the, uh, the entire domain. So the picture is actually a little bit cloudy. Now there are downsides to freelance work. There's really probably less flexibility than you think. You can't say no too often, because there won't be any more work. And you have to juggle many clients. I'm going skilled. Uh, development is also a big issue. But perhaps the most significant issue is the precarious nature of gig work. Getting paid is hard to do. The pay can be inadequate, and pay theft is a very real concern. From the business perspective, though, two-sided markets are efficient. Employers can be more agile. The talent, talent management challenges, therefore, may be worth the effort. But nobody asks what happens to competitive advantage when people walk out the door. So while there's many new research opportunities, it's really scary to me that some of the measures that we rely on, particularly formative ones who are targeted at emerging constructs, may no longer meet the needs as the work context itself has actually changed. The not so subtle changes in work context then will generate a lot of research opportunities for us, mirrored by the talent management challenges that follow. Just think of these as dissertation topics. <laughs> Finally, the gig economy may not be a matter of choice for us. These are some of our peers who are already participating. Look at the labor rates that they're quoting you. Let it sink in for a moment, and I'll rest my throat. <laughs> the, the demand side's not really any better. Those who want expertise aren't necessarily willing to pay what we might want, and I can assure you that I could not live on this. Not in my lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've just scratched the surface. There's a lot of places you can go. I'm going to give you two quick hints. Go to gigeconomydata.org 
and that's going to take you all kinds of places you need to go. I'd also highly suggest you look up the work of Catherine Abraham, who's an economist at the University of Maryland, and follow her work. Uh, in the end of the day, I think that what we need to be drawn to is how, how do we help our or the client organizations understand what they can do as this all changes and how they are able to retain competitive advantage. Thanks.